Uh, okay. Oh, I'm on. Okay. Thank you. That's the sign that we should get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, and for those brave of you who have joined us in the room today, because we know we're competing uh, with another uh, session that's high on the agenda, Ukraine. So thanks a lot uh, for coming. I know a few of the sessions were starting late or were lasting a, a little bit over time. So hopefully we'll get a few more participants uh, who join you today. But thank you for, for joining us. And um, our panel today uh, is called um, From a Dangerous Cocktail to a Recipe for Peace. So addressing the interlinkages between cl climate, conflict, and food security. Um, and I'm Renée Larivière. I'm the Director of Programs at Interpeace, and I'll be moderating our, our discussion. Uh, first, before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank the government of Slovenia, of course, for making, making this a, a priority topic uh, for them and giving this the space. I now realize we are missing a panelist, so I'll gently warm up. Uh, she was just here a minute ago. <laughs> I think she's went to the loop, hopefully, but she'll be back. We can get started. She's not the first one on the, <laughs> on the question list. Um, but before I introduce the panel, uh, perhaps what I can do is just uh, share a few statistics, uh, actually, on, on the topic to get us uh, warmed up. And I'm afraid that it's a, a little bit of a pessimistic outlook uh, in a certain way. Uh, and according to a lot of the numbers and reports out there that have been, uh, okay, our next panelist has come, thank you. Um, yeah, according to a lot of the scientists and uh, think tanks and organizations uh, like the World Bank, particularly uh, the World Bank's uh, food insecurity uh, update, the latest report that they've just published, um, the number of severely food insecure individuals has actually increased by some 220 million over the last three years. And that's a number that's quite worrying. Um, it's also very distressing because um, of the significant gains that we've made in the development world or in the on development in the last decade. In addition to that, I was talking to some colleagues as well uh, over the last few days from the World Food Programme. Um, they were saying that we found that some 80% of the world's worst food crisis are actually driven by war. Uh, and we just have to look at the events in Ukraine um, that has shown how uh, conflict can feed hunger. It can force people out of their homes, of course. It wipes out um, sources of income and also essentially destroys um, economies uh, as well. But, you know, um, I'm a peace builder and I'm, I'm eternally hopeful. So there's reason to be hopeful as well, despite these very pessimistic uh, statistics that uh, are published. Um, so because there's new attention also being brought to the climate conflict uh, nexus, and it's now more than ever at the forefront of the international agenda um, as well. And this panel today is very timely as well because Slovenia is actually becoming um, a member of the UN Security Council in January and is going to address climate change as a priority at the Council uh, as well. So again, I'm very hopeful uh, as, a, as a peace builder myself. So you'll hear today uh, from our speakers about um, the different uh, challenges and hardships of this nexus and breaking down the silos and how to collaborate across the different sectors. And, and you know, these are vastly very different types of topics. We're talking about conflict, climate change, uh, and food security. These are all very technical aspects. And can we really work together? And is that possible? So you'll hear from our speakers here uh, about the challenges, but also inspirational stories that despite the difficulty and the challenges of working across the nexus and bringing this rhetoric into practice, um, that there are successful stories uh, as well to hear from um, in terms of collaboration. So I have the honor of welcoming our distinguished panel uh, today for the conversation. Let me briefly introduce them. Uh, we have Eva here on my uh, left side, who is a cl climate policy and human rights advisor to the president of Slovenia. Welcome, Eva. We have Ambassador uh, Brengelman, who is the dean at the Global P uh, Diplomacy Lab. Welcome. We have Hassan Ismail, who is uh, the country representative uh, for Interpeace in Kenya. We have Tina, also on my right side, who is a climate, peace and security policy scientist at CIGAR. And we have Cyril Ferrand, who is a resilience team leader at FAO in the Horn of, uh, or Eastern Africa, I should say. Uh, so welcome, everyone. And let us get started uh, with our panel. 
And I'd like first to turn to you, Tina, if I may. Um, you have a very long experience uh, from the MENA region. You're based in Egypt, and you have been working there for a number of, uh, of years. And you know and you've seen firsthand of the, the field complexities of bridging these silos um, across these different sectors and how we need to intentionally make efforts to try and understand these various root causes, whether it's conflict, climate, or food security in some of the world's most fragile um, environments. And as a scientist yourself, um, you've seen the evidence of how food security has impacted climate change, but also conflict. And so my question to you um, is really, to what extent are we knowledgeable about the impact of food security on climate um, and peace? And what are some of recommendation and what advice would you have to these different actors in the room also, maybe perhaps uh, who are listening to us, on how to break down these, these silos in order to address this nexus. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to make an argument that was already made in part by the, the panel this morning on, on water diplomacy that I think we really have to place um, food security right in the center of the understanding or definition of climate security. Because often I think it's understood too much in terms of military armed conflict, but there's so many different layers of, of security in there, water security, resource security, uh, human security, livelihood security. So it's, it's really a very complex kind of uh, recipe. And I think we're currently with our scientific approach lacking a little bit the indicators or the methodologies to study the, the, the complexity of this. Um, because it's really, we, we call it compound risk. So these are all risks that interact, intersect with each other. They intersect with pre-existing structural inequalities. And I think we don't yet have enough understanding how, how these are working together. So at CGIR, we're actually working on multiple projects that are bringing different indicators together. We've launched something called the Climate Security Observatory that is bringing together climate data with conflict data but also fragility, conflict, and migration. That's looking at different you know, types of fragility and specifically with a focus on migration. Um, a second point I'd like to make is a focus that, on positive peace. Uh, so peace is not just the absence of conflict, but it's also really promoting an atmosphere where uh, you know, there's community ties, there's, there's resilient livelihoods where people can, can prosper, can participate. Uh, social cohesion was mentioned this morning in a panel. Um, so that also means that there's an absence of structural violence and, structure, and like deep-seated inequalities. So access to resources, uh, access to water, um, inequalities in, in, in kind of accessing ecosystem services, those are all working against peace, right? And, and I think we can turn this around and, and you know, try by, make, by, by addressing those, we can actually try to make transformations uh, towards, towards peace. So, so if we work on food, land, and water systems, which is kind of CGIAR's premise and strength, um, I think we can really try to help make transitions towards more peace-sensitive use of, of natural resources, use of, of, of uh, land, land management, uh, food production. And I think we have to work at two different levels. So one level is kind of like the farm the farm level transformation that has to happen. And, and there's huge transforma transform transformations that need to happen. For example, where I'm based in Egypt, we have you know, tens of millions of farmers who are using flood irrigation, who have to really you know, transform their, their livelihoods into something that is more climate smart, uh, maybe more protected agriculture to really work towards those threats that we as scientists are already uh, kind of um, projecting for, for the region. And that's a huge effort. I mean, how are farmers going to make that change? So we have all of these really good uh, kind of models on the ground. Uh, CGIR has, has quite a lot of work you know, on ground with farmers testing things, doing applied science. But um, a second step is to really help farmers to, to, to replicate that. You know, how you can have a very successful model on the ground, but it, if it's just a model, then it doesn't make a, a big change. So what are the kind, of, um, you know, the kind of environments that governments have to create to, to replicate this, to put farmers in a position where they can afford this, where they can finance this transformation that, that needs to happen? Um, so in Egypt, we're talking a lot about uh, specialized loans, low interest loans, um, private sector involvement in, in finance, uh, knowledge for farmers. So there, there really has to be kind of this um, 
yeah, this this uh, this enabling policy environment, you know, that can help make that transition at, at a larger scale, at a food systems uh, scale. So, um, so these are all things I think we we're working on, and I think partly they're not happening yet because, as you were saying, there's too many silos, right? So I think often specifically climate change is located in the Ministry of Environment, mm -hmm. and you know all of these different types of security that play together so closely, they they cannot be addressed by one ministry alone. And I think we're kind of currently still lacking models for ministries to really work together on these challenges on the ground, not just theoretically, not just with one committee, but you know, to share um, <coughs> mandates, budgets, you know, the, the institutional processes are missing that you know, ministries can really work together on something like climate security, food security on the ground. Um, so uh, yeah, how to get rid of the silos? I think uh, there needs to be a better understanding of what climate security is, mm -hmm. uh, the complexity of it. Um, how to integrate that into policy policy uh, formulation and, and implementation in a more concrete way. Data sharing is something that is missing in our region and the MENA region. Uh, ministries are just not sharing data yet. Um, that is really needed to build a climate secure future. Um, also building knowledge of what works on the ground. This morning, you know, people were making, the panelists were making the point that we need more locally relevant solutions. So including kind of local experience, local knowledge into, into policy making. Um, I think that's also not, not yet happening. I think there's some really hopeful kind of examples. Kenya, I think for climate security is often named as like a success story for kind of decentralizing uh, climate change decision making or um, also, so FAO uh, projects, for, uh, for example, um, uh, working um, you know, in different countries. Uh, and then um, the IMI, IMI projects and the MENA drought project, for example, in Jordan, uh, and so, sorry, that one's working in, in Lebanon. Um, they're actually trying to bring together or to, to bring together different ministries and, and create this participation that's both horizontal and vertical uh, to see how we can kind of break down um, those silos. Um, so, I work for a place that's called the CGR Amina, Amina uh, Climate Security Hub. We have a regional hub now out of Cairo, working out of Cairo on regional climate security. And we're trying to build this kind of scientific evidence that's needed uh, for food, land, and water systems to bring all of those different indicators <coughs> together, to try to measure things in a more integrated way, and to help governments in the region kind of integrate uh, climate security you know, with other types of security, like water and food security, into their policies. Um, and then really to try to implement that. Um, I think there's a lot of open questions still. Um, you know, what, what are the actual, when has a government done a good job at, at, at you know, having climate secure or peace sensitive uh, food systems policies in place or generally climate security policies? Um, you know, what are the, what's the recipe for that government kind of approach or governance approach? Um, I think this is something we're still working on. Uh, there's still a, dis a lot of discussion around this in the region, um, and I hope that you know the science that we're building can maybe contribute to to building some of the needed evidence that can then inform um, policy making. Thank you. Thanks, Tina, uh, for your remarks. I think um, I'm going to park a question, a provocative question, for the end, because uh, you've uh, ignited a lot of reflections uh, with your with your remarks. Um, but just building on some of the last uh, points that you did raise, I want to turn to Amb Ambassador uh, Brengelman. Um, just to build on the, you know, from going from the technical aspects to the policy aspects. And so, Ambassador, if I can turn to you now. Um, the UN Security Council addressed the, the triple nexus, the climate, security, and, and peace uh, nexus during its meeting in June uh, in New York. And given your experience as a diplomat, um, you know, how can the international system, particularly the UN architecture, evolve and transform to be more responsive to these challenges of, uh, of this triple nexus? And uh, just given your breadth of experience as well, you know, what are your views on whether or not multilateral action uh, can address some of these challenges, particularly when the consequences of climate change, of conflict, of war, is really felt at the local level, but not in, in New York? Um, so. I'd like to ask you those, those questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm since a few months the dean of the uh, Global Diplomacy Lab, but have been a German diplomat before. 
And perhaps I will look at that question in terms of some of the last uh, postings I had, because they had a very different way of looking at it. So when I served at NATO, that was certainly not an expert on food security, but more on hard security. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, nevertheless, at NATO headquarters, we realized already some time ago that we are not free of that nexus and that we really needed to look into a broader picture when we did uh, conflict management or crisis management, as we would call it. So we started things like the comprehensive approach, engaging with civic society, etc., because we realized you need to look at other elements as well. And believe it or not, it was part of my job to have yearly consultations with organizations like the IOM, like the International Committee of the Red Cross and the on, and yearly consultations with the United Nations, because we were not in a context-free environment, and we realized that. Mm. So um, the next posting then was Brazil. And here it is not about an external conflict, mm. but about a domestic situation where you have small farmers, etc., in the Amazon, being confronted by a situation where big cattle farmers and, and others who would like to, to use uh, the raw materials of, of the Amazon. And in that, conf in that more internal conflict, we were kind of engaged in terms of being a member of the Amazon Fund. Then I will not hide that. During the term of Bolsonaro, we were quite disappointed on that front. So, our engagement in the Amazon Fund came to a stillstand, and now with Lula being back into office, we, we engage again in, in that. And clearly, when you, when you live there, when you did policy there, this issue of how comes uh, climate and, and conflict together, you could just not run away from that observation. And it might surprise you now, the next posting was The Hague. So you might think, what, what on earth uh, was the nexus there? So the ambassadors to The Hague are not just the ambassadors to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but also to the international courts. So you talk a lot about genocide, crimes against humanity, and all we do there is linked to those issues. But in the back of things, for example, Professor Philip Sands, who's known in international law circles, started a debate on ecocide. So to make something similar when it comes to the environment and climate to what has happened in the past when people violated international law in terms of crimes against humanity or genocide. Alas, all of that has come to a little break now because with the situation given uh, by the Russian invasion into Ukraine, many of the things which we have started are now deviated in terms of attention, if I might put it. We have a war. In NATO, we are now looking again more at Article 5 than anything else. Build up your defenses, build up your eastern flank. That's a reality. And uh, so we have quite a polarization in the international system in a moment where actually we would need more than ever international cooperation, we actually are facing, that is the reality, growing polarization. And last not least, uh, money. This morning we had the water diplomacy workshop, a money talk, somebody said. So the money is now, given the criminality, money is now going into other means, defense. So in my own country, the chancellor said, tighten vendors, so we do one billion for the German Bundeswehr because there has not been enough money in the past. You can imagine what you could have done with 100 billion euros, but this is now being spent on defense. So we might be coming to, to the question how we can do better, uh, safeguard the multilateral system. I personally a strong believer of that. I've heard yesterday there's a multilateral system, there's a bipolar system, there may be the plurilateral, but I still believe in the multilateral where everything comes together. So I hope the United Nations and I hope Slovenia being a member of the Security Council can have an impact there, that the United Nations and all the other multilateral organizations need to keep their place and uh, I think the new element, and uh, that is something we need to continue to, to educate, so to say, 
more impact by civic society, more impact by NGOs in what we do, and, and traditional diplomacy perhaps has come to a little finish line on that front. It must not always be like the last generation, so to say, uh, but uh, certainly I think that needs to be, to be stronger. And yeah, and again, money, we need to spend the right amounts of money for that. If, if we mean it, what we say, then we need to spend the money on it. That would be my point. Thank you. So I see you're a peace builder as well. You're also very hopeful, uh, like me. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not an optimist right now. But okay. at the same time, <laughs> hopeful, I, I would I probably said. term myself as a realist. But realism doesn't mean to be a, a defectious, you know, somebody who's giving up. No, to the contrary, you need to continue fighting it, the cause. OK, I love the enthusiasm uh, and the energy. We certainly need that, particularly how uh, world events are causing further polarization, as you were saying, rather than collaboration uh, between states and the international community, uh, generally speaking. Um, I'd like to turn to Hassan and go uh, from the policy sphere, multilateralism, to really the local context. Uh, as, I was saying, as I was saying earlier, uh, that is where most of the consequences of either climate change or food insecurity and, and, and armed conflict is, are being felt. And you've been working largely with uh, pastoralist communities in northern Kenya, both on uh, food security, but also on peace uh, issues. And you, coming you know, from uh, really seeing firsthand uh, the consequences of, of the impact of these um, of armed conflict, what are some of the lessons that we can draw about how peace building can contribute to climate change or uh, food security or food resilience, uh, I should say? And what are some of the recommendations you would make to the audience or to the multilateral actors uh, as well in terms of bridging this gap as well between the local and, uh, and the policy sphere? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the, when you look at the local context of the interplay between climate change, food security, and conflict. I think the nexus are obvious. These are not things that require scientific research or uh, a lot of detailed analysis to look at the linkages between each of them. Uh, climate change is, uh, as much as the people who you know contribute towards uh, the detrimental effect of climate, are most of the industrialized uh, communities. The impact is universal. Uh, I also want to uh, reiterate that we, the, the, the floods that we had in Slovenia, uh, we, 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 we really uh, hope that they're going to recover quickly. And the same, while others uh, have floods and, uh, and, and other climatic conditions, the other regions have drought and uh, you know, severe extreme temperatures, you know, variation in the entire ecosystem, you know, invasion of, you know, weeds, uh, some plants that have never been there, the soil texture change into either acidity or uh, alkalinity, and the, the entire impact of, of, of climate change is very clear in those areas. You find, uh, even for me, you know, the shallow wells that I used to fetch water from when I used to be a young boy have all dried up. And uh, just to give you a very simple statistics, we have had a very devastating uh, drought in Kenya. And, and my own county where I come from, we have about 258 earth pans that uh, usually keep water and all of them dried. We have about 280 uh, shallow wells, they all dried. And out of the 220 boreholes that we had, about 15 of them had to be closed down because of the impact of drought and climate change because of salt, salt intrusion in, in those wells. So you can imagine the impact of just water in one component, and, and water is life. It's the what sustains livestock, it's what sustains agriculture, it's what sustains livelihood, and these are all things that have round up around the issue of the impact of climate change. And therefore, climate change, to a greater extent, uh, exacerbates food insecurity and also uh, conflict. Uh, on the converse, you know, Conflict also worsens the, the situation on the other side. Violent conflict uh, tend to uh, undermine communities' resilience to respond, to sometimes even uh, cope, and even uh, you know adapt to uh, new livelihoods. Because uh, whenever there is pressure from climate change, we expect people either migrating. You can't migrate when there is conflict. You can't. Food access and movement becomes a problem. 
access to water, access to pasture becomes a problem. And therefore, conflict is also a major impediment to livelihood in general. Uh, and uh, on the food security cycle, I think the nexus is very clear because people who are food insecure naturally undertake mechanisms, uh, coping strategy to live. Nobody wants to die of hunger. So if your uh, livestock have died or you are an agriculturist and there's no rain uh, because of conflict or because of, you end up doing, you know, charcoal burning. You are destroying the environment. And in the rivers, you increase the food insecurity web because by compromising the climate uh, condition. So the whole nexus between conflict uh, climate and food insecurity is just a very clear uh, issue on the, on the ground. Uh, but when it comes to the pastoral communities, the nexus is much more complicated because uh, the entire economy base is based on livestock that need to migrate, that need to move from place to place in search of water and pasture. And these migrations require, you know, cooperative host communities that receive you. So you'll find migrating communities from the pastoralists going into the natural, national parks, moving into territories that belong to other communities. And once there is no peace, there are no compromises between these communities in terms of sharing resources. Mm -hmm. And this is where conflicts occur. And there, you know, livestock raids occur and the people become improvised. And uh, our peace building work helps now in trying to create a common narrative, a common understanding between communities that these adverse climatic conditions and challenges that we face uh, cannot be overcome by one person. And therefore, we need to work around collaborative sharing agreements of rich natural resources, access to passage, and so on. At the global nexus is the same, where the crisis and conflict in, 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 in Ukraine and Russia, uh, you know, and anywhere else, has contributed adversely to the rise in oil prices, the rise in food, and everyone is experiencing. And therefore, conflict to a greater extent uh, beyond the food insecurity and climate change is the biggest denominator. You know, if I look at the three, I would have said conflict is like the, the biggest, well, many a time, you know, when we look at um, uh, the, the humanitarian development peace nexus, the P is at the, at the end. Uh, I would prevail when, you know, you put the P in front and then put a hyphen and then put the D and H in front. Basically because peace is a precursor for, for development, peace is a precursor for humanitarian services, you can never provide humanitarian mm -hmm. services and developmental uh, incentives where there is no peace. And therefore, uh, unfortunately, what we see in terms of the at operational level, both at financing, uh, less resources is available for peace building and more is available for humanitarian aid. And you know, for the vicious cycle has been maintained for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so I would uh, think that I think we need to really realign our thoughts around the issue of how do we prioritize and what do we do we need to continue providing emergency humanitarian services and relief and food and water to communities or do we need to uh, work around conditions that will prevent the crisis from occurring and these are investment in peace and i think there is less percentage in terms of peace investment globally uh, and more incentivized approach towards response and i'm sure this is uh, very clear in ukraine war People are now running, oh, let's, you know, let's invest in Ukraine, let's support them in this. So basically because their people were dying, their house is being destroyed, and there's a lot of attention towards humanitarian response. Hardly do we put in preventive diplomacy, uh, prevention of crisis. Uh, a lot of resources would have really uh, rebuilt, I think, the, 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 you know, would have uh, dumped the, 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 the magnitude of crisis. And uh, I think from... Uh, so for one, I think what I, I suggest is that we need to look at the, uh, the, 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 the nexus between the, the HDP and, 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 and try to reframe it afresh globally to, 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 so that we don't, we don't invest a lot in uh, managing crisis, rather we do a lot of preventive investment so that we, you know, even if there is conflict, we know conflict is a natural consequence of human interest and human uh, needs and so on. But the adverse effect of the crisis can always be managed. Whenever there are resilient structures that manage, uh, there are mechanisms for managing conflict, the devastating effect of conflict is likely not to, to happen. Uh, on the other uh, issue I would want to is sometimes we do the nexus in a form of, uh, you know, lessing conflict sensitivity, some peace dividend, 
and some kind of, and we were inspired to do a bit of some peace, uh, peace, 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 peace building approach to our development and humanitarian access. Uh, and, and hardly do this uh, lens of uh, uh, go towards really addressing peace issues. Peace is sometimes uh, the lack of peace or conflict is uh, structural issues that require similar investment as much as the developmental and as much as you know the, 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 the humanitarian itself because the, that issues that is making conflict and continues to impede communities against one another are substantive. It's, so you cannot say we will do a road project, we'll do this development and by, by putting some small conflict sensitive programming and lens, this literally doesn't also help. So I think those who are inspired even to do the HPD, uh, the, the H, uh, DP Nexus should also look at it in the sense that we didn't do. And finally, uh, I think uh, the, the whole uh, mechanism by which we, we need to look at peace should always also look at you know, how, how do we do engagement at peace, sometimes at communal level. At, uh, you know, at institutional level and at uh, diplomatic level, you know, the track one, track two, track three. And most of the times we are also bogged around uh, conflicts, conflicts that cannot be addressed. Uh, we think that uh, if you are not able to address a conflict context at track one, you cannot address it at track three. And uh, I think our research and our engagement with communities have shown us that protracted conflict, like an example of Marsabit, Marsabit is the county in, in, in Kenya, where we had conflict for the last uh, 10, 15 years. It's political, it's supremacy between two ethnic groups, communities that live there, uh, and it's political leaders and people at the top part of the communities that are fighting, so, you, know, they are in, you know, causing the conflict. And, and when we, several initiatives failed, but when we started to look at and start the peace building program in Marsabit, we ended up having a situation where we had to look and say, why did the previous ones fail? So if you put premium of peace building mainly on one lens, like track one is the solution to the problem, we ended up using track three and it ended up the conflict. As we were speaking, uh, the other day I was just talking to one of our development uh, partners saying the last four years they had a major investment in Marsabit that could not take place, but now we are hearing that the situation has changed. Hardly do they know that the situation changed basically because of the, how peace can be reoriented. So uh, I would also implore globally, we need to look at uh, relationship building along conflict lines. You know, wherever you have a conflict, there are these communities that are on the borderline of the conflict. They have had historical relationship, they have blood ties, they have cultural relations, they have trade relations. So if two countries at the capitals so don't agree, the peoples on those border where there's this conflict have always common narrative and common history that can bring them together. Let's give and explore mechanism by which we build, you know, peace uh, in more of a, that kind of a situation. So I think uh, I look forward to see how we can be able to, uh, you know, relook at the, the, the three uh, and, and, and in all of them they deserve their, uh, you know, adequate attention uh, at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. I think you've painted a very real picture uh, from the ground and the, the consequences at the local level, but also of the, the resilience of uh, communities. And uh, I, I like the way that you've not now launched a new revolution on recalling or renaming the HDP nexus to a PhD nexus and prioritizing, it's my own making, but prioritizing um, other issues, because there has been a lot of focus on humanitarian, there has been a lot of resources that have focused on humanitarian issues and very little actually on these others, uh, or particularly on peace building. Um, and I think that's an excellent segue to uh, our next uh, panelists, uh, going from Northern Kenya to Slovenia. Um, we know that um, <laughs> Eva, you're the advisor to the president, um, and you're very involved in advancing uh, the work at the UN Security Council. And that is just January, um, Slovenia will be a member and will take over the presidency also in September during the UN General Assembly uh, as well. So I'd like to hear from you, how does Slovenia intend to engage on the Security Council on some of these topics? And is that an in inspiration from uh, Northern Kenya perhaps and some of the the remarks from Hassan uh, as well. Does that resonate with you or some of the thinking? Over to you, please. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and first, I would like to thank the 
audience for sticking with us this late into what has already been a long day. So thank you very much and hope not to uh, disappoint your trust. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, what our colleague from Kenya and um, the preceding speakers um, uh, have been saying is absolutely inspiring. And it seems that we will, uh, alongside with other um, members of the... Can you still hear? I think it's my okay. mic. That's Thank you. Yeah, we're sitting right. too close. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the task really is how to... Oh, that will be too much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, great. How do you right trickle here. this uh, understanding, uh, which seems to, which is very clear, um, closer to the ground you go, uh, on climate and security nexus? And I should also explain that by this climate security, climate business security we absolutely understand uh, also food and water security. I mean, and how do you really include that in the whole spectrum of the prevention, peace, uh, I mean, the conflict stage, and then the, uh, the uh, post-conflict uh, peace building. Uh, and so the, the, the task is, how to bring this very clear understanding on the nexus into the Security Council, because they yeah. seem, uh, or, or at least, um, uh, well, in formal terms, they are not there yet, right? But first, I, I really wish to establish how widespread and how acute the expectation on the Security Council to do more on food security, climate, and water security really is. This transpired very clearly as, I should say, a number one expectation shared by the vast majority of the UN membership during our year-long campaign to get elected into the Council. So uh, being very cognizant of our responsibility that we are going to be members in the Council, not only on our own national behalf, but actually on behalf of the wider UN membership. This is a responsibility. Uh, and I should say a number of countries, such as small island uh, developing states or some African countries that are threatened to be overcome by um, desert, emphasize that climate change presents a number one security threat to them. So, um, and some small island states said that impact of climate change on, on small islands was no less threatening than the dangers guns and bombs pose to large nations. Um, so, So the question isn't, I think, if there is a nexus between climate and conflict, but rather how we can use the climate action to stabilize peace and prosperity. In any society, but I think even more so in conflict-ridden societies and in post-conflict stage, it is vital to secure a wider social inclusiveness, and Tina spoke about that, or the social cohesion, or the positive piece. And I would just like to add the enormously important role of women in that as half a population. I mean, unless you include um, also women in peace, peace building process, um, it won't stick, and um, recovery plans to sustain peace need to include not only mitigation, but also adaptation measures uh, for the social resilience. Uh, so, sl 
I really welcome that climate advisors are being included in peacekeeping operations. And uh, obviously, Slovenia will be trailblazing in footsteps of um, previous uh, council members uh, making progress on climate security before us, such as including um, this reference into country-specific resolutions, etc. Uh, there's also scope, I think, with regard to thematic resolutions, such as with regard to uh, women, peace, and security. I see uh, possible um, synergy between the two. Uh, so there has been progress, but it is slow and incremental. Um, according to the University of Edinburgh, uh, which is keeping a database on peace agreements, only five, only five peace agreements actually contain a reference to climate change. So um, there's obvious work to be done. I spoke, uh, well, I spoke about the importance of women and um, why I think so. I explained as half population, but there's also, I mean, generally speaking, women around the world are those responsible for bringing food to the table in their families. So they are the ones, I think, who are vitally interested both in peace and both in effective climate action. So uh, they can continue to bring food to the table, actually. Um, well, also I want to mention how conflicts are environmentally destructive, obviously. Um, and one should look for ways of linking up conflict resolution in the least environment harming way. Uh, so Slovenia will advocate environmental <coughs> peace building. I mean, nature, we, we should keep in mind that nature is our best ally in fighting climate change. And peacemaking should seek to protect civilians and our ecosystems. Uh, and peace building should actively help restore functioning ecosystems. And I'm happy to add here that Slovenia is also um, among very active countries globally uh, in recognizing the right to a healthy environment. Uh, so obviously, all countries should step up efforts to live up to the commitments of the Paris Agreement. This was very clearly uh, in, with floods in Slovenia, because it's exposing all the adaptations, measures we have not taken uh, so far. So it's always, as every good crisis, it should be used to good effect, right, for the future. Um, but this climate adaptation and mitigation, I think, should is even more relevant for those caught up in conflict or trying to recover from it because of the environmental destruction uh, caused by the conflict. Uh, and I really think it is counterproductive to silo these actions that should go hand in hand uh, in the UN country teams or in the UN in general, and Tina already addressed that. Um, but I really think we need to do more within and outside the UN system in this respect. And I was thinking how you can illustrate this, not to this audience, because I think this understanding is very clearly here but particularly when it comes to discussions in New York, that UN should really function like a family. And I should clarify, like a harmonious family, not like a dysfunctional family, <laughs> which is, it is a little bit right now, isn't it? And this involves talking to each other, listening to each other, helping each other, cooperating with each other, spending time together. And you cannot just leave each member of the family or UN entities on their own in their silos world, you know, uh, because 
it will inevitably lead to a dis, uh, dysfunctional family where, well, let's say, one of the kids will resort to drugs, uh, another one will, let's say, become, an, for the sake of discussion, an eco-terrorist activist. The father will always be absent, uh, either working or, as is often the case in Slovenia, cycling. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor mother, uh, not coping with it all, will develop a clinical depression. And this is exactly the same for the UN, isn't it? So I would really appeal for the next year's, um, next year's uh, summit on the future to address it. I think it's vital that the UN addresses this silos uh, problem. So I will stop here for the moment, and thank you. Thank you, Eva. I think you've uh, given us a very good dose of reality in terms of what it what is waiting for you in engaging at the UN Security Council, uh, particularly in terms of aligning interests and priorities of other countries, because yes, it's true, it's not just Slovenia who will be at the forefront, but you'll have to manage everybody around you in your family uh, as well, particularly the member states. Um, but and uh, it's true, we have put a lot of expectations on Slovenia uh, as well. But I, I quite like uh, your... No pressure at all, no. <laughs> Just solve the world problems and this nexus, you'll get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but I think uh, I particularly appreciate the last point that you made of working as a family. And I think you described it really well and I like the, the parallel that you use in the terms of the dysfunctional families because it's true. When we have someone in trouble in our families, we don't just turn around and you know not pay attention to them. If one of our kids is falling into drugs or something, we're going to do everything we can to go help them out. And I think that's an excellent um, uh, a parallel uh, image to paint and to use as well in terms of how do we collaborate better across the UN families, but also across the different sectors um, as well. So I am going to turn to the UN family next to me uh, as well. <laughs> Cyril, you're from one of the UN families uh, as well. We're not going to say it's dysfunctional. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> um, but you also work in the Horn of Africa and um, you've seen firsthand experiences, you have a long experience as well in, in the field and you've seen how particularly um, in, in the Horn how armed conflict has been the main driver of food uh, insecurity as well, but also how food insecurity is impacted by other stress, global stressors um, and global trends uh, across the world. And so I'd like to hear a little bit from you on, you know, how is FAO trying to strengthen food resilience systems? How are they working with other actors uh, as well, whether with other UN families or other organizations? Um, so practically from the UN family, how does that happen? Yeah, with the introduction uh, made on the <laughs> UN family, it makes it easy for me. Yeah? Um, no, look, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, you were starting uh, an introduction with some data, and um, and I think there is a bit of a danger in data, in the way we, we are using data, in the sense that uh, if, if we look at the global report on food crisis, which is the common reference for all, I would say, UN actors, but also NGOs who are part of it from the Global Network Against Food Crisis, we, we are saying that in 2023, 2022, sorry, there were around 260 million people who were severely food insecure, classified in uh, IPC, or Integrated Food Security Phase Classifications 3 and above. Um, and we are saying that 117 were million were basically due to conflict, 84 due to economic shocks, and 56 million due to, uh, due to climate shocks. I think there is a danger in that, because at the end of the day, not one single shock happens in isolation. What we observe, not only in the Horn of Africa, but especially in the Horn of Africa, is a number of shocks happening simultaneously or in a sequence that doesn't allow people to recover from the previous shock. And we can look at uh, what has happened in the, in the Horn of Africa from drought in 2016, at the same time, we had floods also in part of the region, in South Sudan, for example, then we had desert locusts, then we had drought again, and now we are basically looking at, at floods coming back in the region. So I think it's important to understand that the resilience of food systems or the resilience of people 
depends a lot on the number of indicators and number of shocks that we need to basically assess, understand, monitor and agree upon together. When we look at how disjointed we are, I think it's primarily due to the fact that each and every single organization, but it goes for NGOs to some extent, we do believe that our analysis is better than the other one. Or we do believe that my tool, the one that I invested on for the past 10 years and for which basically I've received resources, public money, cannot give it up, it's the best one. But maybe it's not my tool that is the best, it's the use of different tools that are making, that is making more comprehensive the analysis we can make. <coughs> so from an FAO standpoint, I would say that what we are very attached to is the consensus building around problems. And I think we tend to, and maybe uh, that's just to spice this group, uh, for those who decided not to go to the Ukraine group, I think we need to spice it up, yeah? I, I think that we tend to over-intellectualize the, the ecosystem in which we are working. When we talk about 20, 30 years ago, food, uh, food security, then we move to resilience, then we move to food system, resilient food system, and then we try to understand what it is about and we talk about the nexus. You will have as many definitions of the HDP nexus as you will have people in this room probably. So I think that we should not over intellectualize it in many ways because pastoral communities that you talked about do not care about it. Mm. What we need to do is to understand what are the issues they are exposed to, what are the, the problems and the shocks they are exposed to, and how do we monitor these shocks. And I think that in that regard, partnership matters a lot. I think that uh, with Interpeace, we have been doing some studies together in the Karam cluster, for example, uh, that is cutting across, for those who are not familiar with it, is a cross-border area. Between, uh, between Ethiopia, South Sudan, Kenya, and, and Uganda. So we have been trying to understand all together with a number of factors about what the issues are. What, are, what are the issues that people are exposed to. And I think it's really important. When we understand the risks that people are exposed to, we need to monitor them. And we need to monitor them in a scientific manner in a way that basically, it doesn't mean that FAO knows to monitor all the indicators. It's about how do we collate and bring collaboration on monitoring a different set of indicators, but the cumulative analysis makes it comprehensive for everyone. Then the next step would be probably um, to look at and decide to make a clear decision of acting together. And I think for acting together we need, and we can say we have a common accountability framework, which are the SDGs, but I would argue that they are far too high when we tend to look at what is happening in the field in a way. Um, and we are lacking this common accountability framework. Um, each NGO will have its own lock frame. Each UN agency will have its own lock frame. Donors are going to impose their own lock frame and their set of indicators because that's basically what the money has been allocated against, which is a strategy of a government, whether it's Slovenia or any other government. And at the end of the day, by having too many accountability framework, we have no accountability. And I think that as a field, we are lobbying for a common accountability framework, which is embedded in Eastern Africa within the work of EGAD, which is Intergovernmental Authority, um, uh, that is basically working with, uh, with member states and, and that is looking in, in, into, into food security, but not only peace as well. What we see emerging clearly, um, for, for, for the region, for Eastern Africa, and, and, and as San was saying that, is pastoralism. I think that the belief that after a drought will come 10 years of opulence or 10 years of good rain, this time is over. The new normal is far different from that. We see in Eastern Africa, in the past decade, three severe droughts starting with the one of 2010, 11, 12, that costed the life of a quarter of a million people in Somalia, to the one in 2016, and at that time we saw that the system changed because we said it did not happen, we didn't reach famine. But we were basically optimistic that the system has changed, which it did not. It was basically a number of people who were still in the region and who were still traumatized by what had happened in 2012, we said never again, and then money came early and we could prevent famine. But then we have seen in the past two years that 
we failed again to address at scale uh, food insecurity and the impact of drought. And scale is the other important element here, is that we have to stop thinking that we can address or we can have macro impact with micro investment. This has to be said, and I do understand, we do understand that there are a number of competing issues and conflicts uh, at the moment, but the reality is that we have to stop thinking that a micro investment is going to produce macro results. That's a reality that we have to, uh, that we have to basically accept. Which means, in my opinion, that we have to be super strategic on, I wouldn't say the low hanging fruit, but into the areas where we know that a certain investment will have potentially a cat catalytic, I would say, impact um, and, and will generate, I would say, multipliers effect. The one that we need to work on is on uh, animal feed. If we talk about pastoral communities, if there is no feed for livestock, the number of children under five that are malnourished and are dying is going to be high. We have documented that uh, in the past couple of years with resources from USAID. It's very clear, feeding animals is feeding children. And for us, we see that the issue of drought is going to increase the challenge on how we are feeding livestock. And basically, drought is also, as Hassan said, I mean, the search for grazing, the search for water is potentially a driver of conflict. People are going to compete over natural resources, they will cross international borders, and, and we know very well what will happen. So for us, one of the key priority in the region is going to be on feed. How do we feed animals and how do we are going to, to change the way pastoral communities are feeding their animals? I think that's an important one. The second example, and, and I will stop there because- Okay, I, yeah. we have enough time. Um, the second example I wanted to, to bring here to, to, to this audience is, uh, is, is again, is, is the, the, um, I'd say the impact of global crisis in, into the Horn of Africa, for example, COVID, the war in Ukraine, um, and, and we see very well that, I mean, it's a high opener on how interconnected or how dependent are some countries on, on food supplies and food systems. The answer that we come collectively with is, well, we need to localize production, which is fine, but I think that we are not doing the analysis right in full. Because the focus there, and I'm turning to you, <laughs> the focus there is to say, well, if we want to increase production and productivity, it's about research, it's about uh, improved seed varieties, it's about micro-irrigation, it's about all of this. It's about fertilizer as well. And yes, it is about it. But can you imagine that we are ready to invest a huge amount of resources in the Horn of Africa in fertilizer, in seeds, in seed, in seed production, seed certification, micro-irrigation, and we are missing one big element, which is how do you store the production that you are making? East Africa is losing four million tons of cereals every year. Four million tons of cereals every year. Four million tons, this is enough food to feed 30 million people per year in East Africa. And the level of food insecure people right now is around 50 million, but pre-COVID was around 30 million. So basically, if you fix post-harvest losses, which is storage, I'm not talking about food waste, I'm talking about storage, you can potentially <coughs> fix food insecurity there. But we are not making basically the analysis complete. And we are basically focusing on where we believe the money is because that's the interest of some development partners or some governments, and we are not basically looking into the evidence of what food insecurity is about and what are the drivers of food insecurity. So I would say all this requires partnership, requires collaboration with private sector, because on the feed sector, we are talking only to private sector. It's so refreshing to talk to private sector because I have to say that uh, I realize that in the UN system, but maybe in the NGOs, we are living in a bubble that is somehow out of space. We are not grounded. And when you talk to private sector, these guys are telling you, ooh, guys, I mean, what you do might not be so right. So it's very interesting to talk to them because they come with solutions. But we need to develop the public-private partnership approach. For that, it's again, it's collaboration. It's, it's also an appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. And I think in FAO, unfortunately, 
we have very little ap appetite for unproven technology. Yeah, but partnership is not only about contracting a company that has a proven expertise, it's also working with them, building with them on basically giving them the opportunity to have a proof of concept by opening up our space and say, well, make a step in my direction, make some investment and I may be able to do the, the next step. So this is basically what FAO is trying to look at into, into Eastern Africa. It's not a great revolution because I don't believe that great revolution do happen, but it's about coming back grounded to common sense on what collaboration and partnership is about, and it is about transparency, it's about risk-taking, and it's about accountability. And I think accountability is what is lacking significantly in our environment now, right now. Thanks. So you're certainly not uh, a traditional UN family member <laughs> in being provocative, but I think what you've done is really brought, uh, I think, a, a series of lessons learned from, from the field, uh, including not to over-intellectualize issues, but keep them simple, because they are simple, but just get the right analysis. And then um, also, I've very much noted the, the need for calibrating accountability frameworks, because it is true, I can't even remember, I looked at this at one point, the number of indicators for the SDGs is astronomical, and even trying to measure that, I can't even imagine who's doing that, but good luck to them uh, as well. But I do agree that uh, common frameworks for measuring impact is, is critical uh, as well to see how we're doing, which then influences the data analysis, which then influences the way you're going to make investments uh, as well. And I think the last point that you've made both on the macro impact versus micro investments, I think is particularly uh, very relevant to the conversation and as well on the private, uh, the PPPs, as we call them, private, private, it's a lot to say in a mouthful, but anyway. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, we have quite a bit of time. There's a few other questions we can ask, but if there's a question or two from the audience, I'd be very willing to, to open the, the floor. There's uh, two, two questions, because we have quite a bit of time, and I think we're a small, intimate group that I think we can be very adaptive. I know, I know, you've, I haven't even had to wave my one minute uh, <laughs> warning to anybody, but please go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Diego Osorio, and so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, very interested because since we, I was reflecting on this, climate conflict and food security, but also we're talking about the, the humanitarian development nexus, we do have to understand that in the humanitarian framework, we have advanced quite a bit in terms of accountability frameworks, response operations, and things like that. And it you made me think, what is the common unit that connects both the humanitarian to the development in the whole spectrum, and that also is a common currency for the private sector and public sector? And you know, working on some of the stuff I'm doing, it comes to mind is risk. Risk assessment, risk evaluation, risk quantification, risk implementation. and and, and that risk seems to be the angle or the vector that seems to facilitate that engagement. Because on the number of risk, like WFP has this risk unit, FAO has this work on risk, we all relate into that quantifiable as a measure to create triggers, boards, uh, measurements, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder, number one, what do we need to do to have or to engage on the work that will help us develop that or accept that notion of common risk, quantification, unification, development, et cetera, et cetera, so that we start working on the same page. That's one element. And the second is that based on that potential quantification of risk, equal and accessible and useful for climate conflict, food security, water security, et cetera, et cetera, how can we build a common accountability framework on that basis? Because there has been a lot of work since the major mistakes of previous humanitarian situations. So uh, I, when I wear the hat of a humanitarian officer, we have a clear sense of what is accountable. But when I'm in development or a political officer, less so. So let's quantify, let's formulate it, and on the basis of that, let's create something that leads us to have that accountability. Because that is what's going to make the possibility of transforming climate action into something that you can sell to a budget officer or a, or a treasury board somewhere. And, and that I'm, I'm saying as a public servant, unless I make it quantifiable, no matter how strong the argument is, it's never going to fly. Thank you. Thank you. 
maybe we can take the second question and then well, you can all reflect on how you're going to answer this impossible question. But anyway, <laughs> uh, well, let's take a second question, and then we'll turn. To <laughs> we're going to turn to the panel for some uh, for some discussion. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to resolve a conflict at the panel. But, but so, it's okay. uh, thank you, and many thanks to the panel. I really got excited hearing um, issues around food security and. Uh, as even talking about the nexus between climate change, uh, conflict, and food security, and more specifically because we spoke a lot around the East African region. My name is Judith. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a livelihoods and food security expert, and this got me so excited about it. Uh, but my question maybe, and this goes to Cyril, um, the UN named 2023 the International Year of Millets. Um, and part of what I think we got to learn after the pandemic and uh, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict was Africa needs to look inwards, or rather the Global South needs to look inwards and see what we can do uh, with regard to our food security, where we can pull the weight. Uh, and this now is with regard to the African traditional crops. When we talk of millets, millets thrive better, do better, require less um, like water for growth, uh, they are more pest resi resistant, and even when it comes to what you're talking about, post-harvest loss, because part of also our food security challenge is we lose so much post-harvest that we are unable to go through the cycle of, you know, uh, from season to season, because maybe um, sometimes it's market linkages, sometimes it's storage, and um, maybe other than millet, there's cassava and, and all the other sorghums that are um, sort of inherent or that are sort of African crops, traditional crops. What is FAO doing to promote these crops, you know, as um, a gap or as a measure to make sure that uh, we're moving towards food security and not just food security, but food security solutions that we can sustain that are like inherent and ingrown in Africa? Thank you. So maybe, <laughs> but uh, thank you, uh, Judith and, and Diego, for your questions. Um, on the first question of common risks and accountability frameworks, does someone feel inspired on the panel to answer that? No, uh, why, Hassan, go ahead. And I'm looking at you potentially, Tina, and Dirk, no. <laughs> we know the last question is yours. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much. I think I'm not a, a social scientist on number of indicators and what, what the risk, so that's not my, 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 but I just want to give an, uh, inspired by Cyril's comment about not to over intellectualize uh, uh, mechanism for accountability and for whatever. Uh, I think there are, of course, each of the, 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 the current, uh, global indexes for different things have got their own parameters at the moment, uh, which I think is not something that we can be able to fix up now and say, okay, this is the, 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 the risk indicators and whatever we can be able to pick. Because if you look at the conflict, uh, the global conflict index, and uh, there are parameters that are completely used for conflict. The food security, there are also parameters that are used for global uh, measurement of uh, uh, global food insecurity and the risk measurements around and, 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 and to health and to every other sector, I think they are already. I think uh, from the inspiration we got from Cyril, I think there's need for the UN, especially now that uh, Slovenia is also, the, the, the need to work around, you know, collaboration of these data is, is very essential and this probably goes to a number of academics and institutions that are from academic to be able to help us guide and I think there is no quick fix answer I would probably be able to, to, to say. But I have one caution. Mm. Uh, having come from the global south, uh, these risk metrics that are used globally have always been an impediment to a number of institutions and the, 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 the especially part of African countries to access opportunities and, and, and resources and, and you know, investments. And, 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 and this is very clear when you look at uh, the president of Kenya. Uh, a number of times he has, and, and most of African heads of state are now uh, asking for a fair balance in terms of what is being used globally to measure risk, to measure, uh, you know, and so on by the international markets, whether it's World Bank or multilaterals in terms of loans and development incentives and so on. Uh, and, and you, this country, 
you give it a, a risk metrics and say, oh, this one uh, has more risky, and this one is less risky, and this one is high risky, and therefore you end up giving loans to three different countries, one at 1% 1 interest, another one at 20% risk rating at the global level, basically because you have already stigmatized the country through these kinds of risk metrics uh, that are usually used. So I, I, I'm just, I was just a bit cautious in, the, in, in even the numbers and the narratives we use, uh, whether this risk matrix is going to be positive for investment or is an impediment for investment for addressing some of this global change. These are the things that we really need to know. What is the intention of this risk matrix that we really need to have a common narrative around? If a place is, uh, is said to be more riskier than another one and it's likely to have less investment, we are likely to continue digging a deeper hole for those part of the country in terms of losing out on international development and catching while you know those who are less risky uh, becomes like you know the the most favored and, and investment gets more so these are the and, and i come from, from a borderline country a county country where we have uh, international communities and ngos and international ngos saying mandera is is insecure yeah. the borderline is insecure we cannot go and monitor projects so what do we do we go and invest the little support we have to areas where you can be able to travel, where the fund officer can be able to monitor the project. And, and, and so you have got a very completely disparity in development, and you end up having the, the border lines dropping out into severe conflict, and later on eating up the investment that you have done in there. So I think there is all these issues I, I, that's yeah. worrying me a little bit about what is the use of this number and how are we going to use it because it can be used positively and negatively uh, to Absolutely. different thank you does someone else on the panel want to make an additional contribution um maybe i just wanted to say something about about the indicators that you were talking about i, I mean one point i would like to make is i think that often we're lacking the social indicators in, in our risk assessments, uh, social vulnerability indicators, uh, for example, gender. I was very happy yes. that if I was bringing yes. up uh, gender. Excellent. I mean, for example, um, <laughs> we're not even, like the data that we have is often not even sex disaggregated. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we cannot even tell how men and women uh, or different genders are experiencing uh, climate change. So I think uh, we really have to reassess our indicators and our measurement. Um, and if we can arrive at a common uh, list of indicators, that would be great. But I think the social ones are often the ones uh, that are missing. And in terms of the, the, the short term to longer term, I think what's also an issue that we're seeing is that there's different actors involved, right? So the short term kind of humanitarian responses, often the UN agencies on the ground. Um, and then as you're, you know, as you're going ahead to the longer term development, then you're getting state actors involved, and that's like, you know NGOs. So it, it's 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 different types of actors, and then often you have to switch from one to the other, which is also challenging. So if you have migrants, for example, you know you, you give them immediate aid, and then they stay longer, and then you have to t talk about social protection, what they really need, uh, you know what they need to to build kind of food systems, livelihoods. So so I think kind of getting those different actors aligned as you're moving from the shorter term to the longer term. This is actually a project that we're working on right now in, in the MENA region to assess how that, how that works and, and what sort of support uh, we can get people with, with evidence and data to, to kind of make that transition. Thank you. Aha, uh -huh, you have decided right. to make an, a contribution. Yeah, but on it. something else, which uh, you okay. mentioned. <laughs> you mentioned the point about uh, we need peace up front and we should always look at that to be the first thing as the precursor for everything else. And I think this nexus between climate and security is going to grow, unfortunately. And I think we will see climate situations not as a precursor sometimes, but as the origin mm -hmm. of difficult situations. And therefore, somebody said in five treaties we have elements of climate included. Yeah. I think that means when it comes to international treaties and international diplomacy, and I indicated international law, we need to hurry up because we are running behind what is happening with how we can respond to it. And, and I think that is, for me, a worry. We don't need to wait for ecocide, uh, which I mentioned a moment ago. But for example, I, I was impressed by a ruling in a court in the Netherlands about Shell in Nigeria. And that is something which has to do also with awareness and pressure. Absolutely. And I think this Connex needs to be bigger in the future, uh, or more, more 
uh, use, salary. Absolutely. I think we have one or two minutes left, and we have a question uh, for you, especially, Cyril. Before that, maybe one thing on, on risk, and Diego, Diego left, but... Um, his bag um, is still there, but... Sorry? His, his bag, bag is still there, let but... Me, let, me talk, <laughs> let me talk to the bag, yeah, or to the phone. Oh, he's just coming in. Maybe he's He's recording. drawing attention to you. Diego, he's... Welcome back. We're finally no, answering no, no. your question. Yeah. But. No worries, <laughs> no worries, no worries. Well, you have two kids, small age outside. Okay. <laughs> Risk is not only about security, and I think that's important. We, yes, we, when absolutely. you look at private sector, in the context of private sector, when we talk to the industry of, of feed, animal feed, and the one who are established in Kenya, that they are Dutch or French, for example, they are telling, when we say, well, you are selling feed in Kenya, where is it coming from? They said, it's imported from France. I said, but why don't you do transfer of technology? And they said, because there is a risk. And I said, what is the risk? The risk is that if we transfer technology and if we are not protected by a proper regulatory framework for quality control, mm. our name is going to be basically spoiled because the quality that might be produced locally might not be the same than the one that is produced in France. So I think risk is not, just wanted to make that yeah. remark that risk is not security, it's also about either the market is too small and then the investment that they make is not worth it for them or there is a certain risk that they don't want to take. Um, either uh, either uh, they don't want to go further north in Kenya because how can they sell feed? I mean, their main client, for example, is on the dairy farms, less so on the pastoralists who used to enjoy free feed, free food access. And how do you basically change the mindset of people? So risk has different dimension in the private sector. And I think, again, we need to understand it. And we need to talk to private sector, but also among ourselves on yeah. how do we help them coping with this risk. Back to, the, back to you, Judith. Uh, well, there is no straightforward, there is no one minute answer, let's put it this way. I think that uh, for a long period of time, we have been promoting, in, with the support of CG centers, but with the support of uh, bioengineering and technology, we have been doing a lot of hybridation, hybridation, looking at uh, cross, uh, crossing varieties and saying these are the varieties that are more adapted. And I think it was very much supported also by the Bretton Woods institutions, we heard about them yesterday in the introduction, is that maybe there is a need to rethink that, because it was a lot of investment on areas that would basically pay big dividends, the high return on investment. We do realize that we have, if we take maize, for example, in Kenya, we have pushed the limit of higher up north where maize could grow. And now with climate extreme, we see the, the, the zone of maize reducing, shrinking. So of course people will have to consider either you want to have a bumper harvest every three years and the rest of the, of the time poor harvest, or you want maybe less bumper harvest, but more stable production. And that's maybe what farmer needs, is not basically an oscillation on their harvest that is too big. They want predictability of the crop. And this goes with basically local crops, millet, sorghum, and of course the root uh, the cassava that is uh, quite important. So yeah, we, we acknowledge the importance of rethinking that. That goes the same for feed. Huh? We go to uh, Bracaria, for example. <laughs> Bracaria is a variety that is, we, we are bringing back Bracaria to Africa, which is an indigenous, uh, uh, basically, species that has somehow disappeared and need to return there. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Cyril, and thanks for everyone who uh, joined us uh, in this uh, competing of interest, uh, or competing paddles uh, with Ukraine next door. Um, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to approach our, our panelists, uh, but we, we must wrap up. I'm getting the sign that we need to, to wrap things up. So thank you very much. And again, thanks to the government of Slovenia for making uh, the space available for this uh, discussion. So voila. Thank you. Thank you.